Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org consequence and the consequence podcast network. Thank you so much for checking us out. As always, you know, the drill, if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button. I do three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I got to tell you, one of my favorite of all time, Jeff Amid from Pearl Jam. He's back with a new solo record called I Should Be Outside. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Kyle. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you again. Uh, first off, the compliments. This is my favorite of your solo records so far. Uh, I've been sort of obsessively listening to it this weekend. You knocked it out, man. Well, that's uh, it's good to hear from somebody that I'm moving in the right direction. So that's nice. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, too, because I know it's not like it's not like I'm sure this this record came from a place of um, of of bright beautiful spots and rainbows and everything i mean this the the story behind this right this this was your pandemic record yeah i mean i i uh as soon as the tour got uh postponed canceled whatever whatever shape it's in right now um <laughs> uh i had a lot of energy so um you know rather than uh you know, have the TV on all day and just getting, you know, and getting bad news after bad news, you know, um, I, I just started going in the studio early in the morning and um, kind of got into a groove and it lasted for three or four months where I was kind of writing something new every day. Uh, a lot of it was bad, um, but it was a super, super fun process. And uh, in the in the middle of that, I actually had three friends pass away from non-COVID related stuff so <clears throat> i had extra time uh to sort of just think about that and then you know you couldn't go to funerals or anything so that was a, that was a tough um i i didn't realize until i was talking about this last week that it, uh, it was actually it's actually kind of a sad record <laughs> so um but. which i think that's understandable you know and i i think you feel the emotions through a lot of these songs i mean they're driving songs you know whether they're angry or or whatever's going on i mean i think that's evident I, it didn't exactly come off to me as a sad record particularly good, good. good. <laughs> um i think there was a line you said maybe online or somewhere where you said you know it's it was a year of carefully measuring waste versus value and that might have been some of the nicest or best unattended advice that I think I've heard lately. Well, I, I think, you know, we, we, we had, we've had so much time. Uh, you start thinking about how, how are we moving forward and are we going to come out of this thing uh, being smarter? Um, and, and currently we're like, you know, it's the hottest summer on record and we've had nineties and hundreds in Montana here for the last four weeks. There's fires everywhere. There's smoke in the air. Um, we have a governor who's just pulled out of the U.S. climate change deal. So I, I, don't, I don't know what the hell his timing has really just been pretty unbelievable. But um, but yeah, I, I think you know all of us should come out of this this thing just you know being better human beings and being better to each other and being better to the planet and. And so I start thinking about like how are we touring and how are we doing things, you know, how, as a band. I mean, we've always been pretty thoughtful, but you, you just want to even be more thoughtful at this point. So that's where we're at. Yeah. Some of that stuff you were saying, I think that come out very, um, very plainly in the in the song. I hear you. Uh, you get you get very raw <laughs> on that song, which which is an interesting if I'm if I'm hearing it right anyway, or, or the way I'm interpreting it anyway, because it is that moment like sure we need to listen to each other but man there's some pardon me there's some fucked up shit coming from some of the yeah. sides out there well it's it's just when you have uh you know friends and family that um who are really great human beings and and great fathers and mothers and great community people and then you know they're just on the other side with a lot of things and so i i'm i'm genuinely uh interested in what they have to say and um you know it's like i i want them to help me understand why they think the way that they they think and um i i think that's the only way moving forward is if we can somehow open up that dialogue to one another and and hear one another you know it's and it feels like right now everybody's just dug in and in their corners and uh it's it's a hard place to be when you have people that you love on the other side so 
Yeah, I deal with that. I was a trying lot. to be a little bit funny with that song and a little bit light. So, um. <laughs> yeah, but I, I get it. I'm, you know, I'm in Kentucky. Uh, I'm Blue Town, Red State. Right. You know, over here, and yeah, and same. you know, when you talk with, like you're saying, the ones you love, the family members, and it's even just beyond, you know, the conservative liberal side republican democrat you know when it's when it becomes like the conspiracy theories and stuff like that you're like how how did that happen you know that's yeah. th that's been the hardest and craziest part for me well and i think i think some of it is you know the people that grew up with walter cronkite you know where he reported the news and the news was the news and there was no emotional or there was no angle on the news it was like this is what's happening I think that generation, they sort of believe what they hear. And so if they're on Facebook and, you know, going back, you know, 20, 30 years with Rush Limbaugh and his radio station and that just kind of that style, um, yeah, you know, it's just lazy reporting and it's emotive and it gets the ratings up. And so it's all about power and ratings and money. And, you know, I, I think in a lot of cases, a lot of those guys don't even believe what they're saying. I mean, they, they certainly they certainly are spewing anti-vax stuff when all those guys are vaccinated so that, right. that's the part that's you know it's like well they're just doing it just to keep the ratings going so it's a dangerous but, dangerous game there as yeah, we've seen you know yeah yeah um you know on the other side of that sort of on the musical side of that too because i want to hit on that for this record uh some compliments um for the ones that guitar is so hypnotizing what you're doing yeah, on there it's, it's a loop <laughs> yeah oh yeah well that makes sense then it's yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be like that I, you know there was a ton of those kind of songs in this process because i was i was trying to write a song every day there for two or three months and so if i just had a loop of something whether it was a drum or a guitar or kalimba or a keyboard or something um it was fun just to sort of change keys over those li little loops of things and um yeah that that one hit me at a at a day when my friend Simon had sent me a a, a really beautifully stenciled skateboard um, from that was taken from a photo of my dad, and on the back of it he just wrote, for, "This is for the ones," and it just seemed, you know, it, the song wrote itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On the song "Life," what you're doing vocally on that one is the thing that stands out. I mean, it's I don't know. Is that just you having fun? Is it like a character that you get to embody in those moments? Well, that, that that's a that song is a cover of a flipper song. So I, okay. I was I was I was trying to I was trying to uh, I didn't want to mimic what Will Shatter how he was singing on that. I wanted it to be my own thing. But there's also like an irony and a sarcasm in. Uh, how he's singing those words so i was trying to capture a little bit of that 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 one was one that's the only one that i recorded in seattle i was i was in seattle uh doing a little editing mixing for this thing and i had i kept thinking like about this song and i thought hey just let me go in and sort of knock it out so i knocked out a drum track put through the bass on it it all happened in about an hour and then john who recorded it was like wow that's really good that, that fits really good with this group and i was like okay like i mean they normally don't say that if you knock something out in an hour so um so we worked on it a little bit and uh i think we i think we trimmed it up um because i wasn't really thinking about the arrangement too much when i was laying it down and um and it just gave this record a different flavor um yeah. so it comes and, and, and also moment. a little bit of a, a little bit of humor which i i felt like the record needed at, at the end so yeah it's interesting that's the one that's recorded in seattle because uh, if you'd asked me okay there's one song on here it's recorded in seattle i would have picked you know who you are like comparisons aren't always fair but uh, like i heard that one's like wow there's there's a bit of an alice in chains harmony thing going on here it's got oh, that funny. mood you know like that would have been the one yeah i could i could see that even with the way that the i mean it's fretless bass but i could i could i could yeah that that makes a ton of sense yeah. Alice in Chains, King's X, that kind of harmony. Right. Yeah. It's just got it's yeah. got that that thing. Whatever whatever. Yeah. I'm not I'm not good on the lingo on a major, minor, you know, for whatever, but it's the way they're laid is like, oh yeah, that's well, that's what it reminded me of anyway. Yeah, I think so. it's minor thirds. Like I think that's the Alice that's the Alice thing, which is they're they're the best in the planet to do that. So yeah. 
there's a really strong artwork uh, tie-in with this whole thing, I and mean, especially if you mm -hmm. you look online, you know, you're you're showing all of these pieces. Um, did they go together? I mean, as I read, right, these are being created together, the art and the songs. Yeah, I mean, it was the uh, you know, I was sort of just bouncing back and forth, and I've always I've thought about that forever and there's and, and we've done it a little bit on pearl jam records where you create a piece of art for the for each song um but i was as i got into this i i thought I, I, it would be great if i could just start to tie some things in like if i'm if i'm stuck in the studio then i would just go out and paint for an hour and um and and back and forth and um and then i just started to tie some things in and even the days that i wasn't in the studio i was still uh, I was still painting something, so um, I, I've been hesitant to put up to this point to kind of put my paintings out there, um, just because I I liked that there was no I was just doing it to do it, and there was no expectation or there's no people saying like you got a gallery show in three months, and so the you know I've I feel like I have plenty of deadlines with the band, so like it was nice to have this medium that. There was no deadline, but when I was finishing this record up, there was just no other thing that I could think of that worked mm -hmm. visually. So I, I, um, I, I threw together. I think I sent uh, Regan Hagar helped me lay it out, <clears throat> and I just sent him everything I had, which was a couple hundred paintings, and he just like started putting them into a grid, and we started moving things around. And then it, I was like, yeah, that makes. I mean, it, it would almost be a lie if I did anything else so it yeah. won out so um i guess can you talk about the style the theme of it i mean we're seeing people characters uh yeah um the noses are always very standoutish <laughs> like like i guess like what brought you to that sort of that that topic in, in the in the arts <clears throat> i don't know i you know i i I feel like I've been stuck on it for a couple of years. I've been just stuck on these kind of portraiture things. And, and I don't, I, right now I'm not, um, I'm not painting from, I'm not using photos or I'm not, I'm, I'm just going in and I'm just throwing paint on the thing and letting it sort of reveal itself as it comes out. It's sort of like, it's sort of more fun that way. And it's, it's kind of the way the record was even made. Like I, I would kind of, going with almost nothing maybe a little piano thing i was playing the night before or something and and this art was kind of done the same way where you're sort of creating something from nothing and you don't know where it's going to take you and as you're smearing the paint on the thing and you're you know then all of a sudden you start to see a face and then and then the then you start you know making the shape of the face within you know all that paint that's on there and if it's bad you just wipe it out um start over um and so there's no theme it's more just like you know your subconscious and trying not to get in the way of uh what you're creating it was, i mean it was the same way with the music it was like i didn't want to go in saying i need to write up tempo song today or i need to write something more hip hoppy today or you know whatever it was like it was like just go in and whatever comes out comes out and if there's something, if there's a good thing about it, then follow that vein to hopefully the end. So, well, I, I will tell you, like, as a fan of your work of of Pearl Jam and everything you guys have been doing for the thirty years, like half the fun for me has been what's the packaging going to look like? You know, what's the artwork right. going to look like? I mean, you all set the bar so high. You know, I brought a couple pieces here. This right here might be one of the masterpieces as yeah. far as what you can get in a vinyl pack or a CD package or anything. I mean, the Polaroids yeah. are coming out with this. Like, and, and I guess yeah. that, that that's kind of part of the question is like, at, at what point does that become what you have to focus on? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we've always been pretty good at like, the artwork doesn't start to happen until the music's 95% done, usually. Um, I mean, the last record was the, and it's the classic thing where our management and the record label, I mean, it, it takes so long to um, create the packaging. They want that stuff up front. And, you know, we're usually, the title is like the last thing. Song titles are changing. Uh, the artwork, the whole theme of the thing is changing all the way up to the end. <clears throat> 
And it's kind of a fun thing because it's, um, it's just what I was talking about where you don't know what it is until you can hear the record and, and the record sort of tells you what the art should be. Um, and, you know, oftentimes it's just Ed and I at the warehouse late, just kind of working through this stuff. And if we're working with an artist, then it's, you know, the last couple of records we've been, we've worked with artists. So it's going back and forth with those guys and giving them a bunch of information at night and having the art come back in the morning and then tweaking that and just having this thing happen. And um, it's, I, I don't even almost know any other way to make a record, you know, it's um, cause it is pretty in-house and it's, it's, it is almost as much fun as making the music. Yeah. I, I imagine, you know, the label or whoever, when you turned in no code, which by the way, 25th anniversary year for that one. I imagine that wasn't the most enthusiastic. Yay. This is what we get to press. I mean, it's so, there's so much going yeah. on. I mean, going all the way back to the second record, we were sort of pushing the, you know, boundaries. I mean, I think on Versus, we were like, we don't want a jewel case. We don't, we don't want plastic. Um, they were like, well, we don't really do that. And, and then we, they came up with these two options and they were, and, and those second, third, fourth records, those, those packages ate heavily into our, our uh, profits. Yeah. <laughs> no code. I don't know if we made any money on that record. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's but. such an interesting record to listen to these days too because like from at least from the stories that i've read heard online in interviews and everything this is sort of like the back against the wall record when there was it feels like maybe there was nothing beforehand like it was one of those you know few times where there was nothing something created from nothing in that moment yeah i mean uh you know there's a there's a couple songs in that record that ed ed came in with but for the most part that record was kind of written in the studio and and really for me when i think of that record i just think about how um what a force jack irons irons was in that record and how seriously he took you know his drum parts and it's you know it's super obvious on in my tree and who you are and mm -hmm. you know present tense and yeah it's 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 a, you know, it's, it's certainly at that point, it, it, it let us know that we could even go more different directions sonically and songwriting wise. And, um, I think we lean on that pretty hard still, you know, I think we, I think every record, we sort of hope that there's going to be a few songs that sort of like stretch us to some other, you know, place in the musical landscape. And, um, I mean, it was a hard record to make because we were we were horrible communicators at that point. We were just like, and, and at the same time, it was kind of the awesome part of making music because we just sat in a room and started playing and we didn't tell each other what to play. We were just doing it. But on the other end of it, it was, um, there was a lot going on that we weren't talking about. So um, we, you know, we're lucky we got through it. We're here. We did stretch and with so many different sounds. I'm going to uh, tongue in cheek, uh, half jokingly bring up, especially this one right here with Olympic <laughs> Platinum. <laughs> I don't and know. This, was, this is one of the ones that hasn't been performed live yet, I don't think. So it's. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was all Nick Didia, who was uh, the engineer on a lot of those records. Um, you know, at the end of almost every night, the conversations get silly and you get, um, you know, it's almost like you're so tired, you're. You know everything's funny, and that song was uh, came out of one of those. Uh, you know, and Olympics were happening, yeah. Um, so yeah, Nick Didia. <laughs> well, the B side "Smile," uh, I think you wrote the music on that. That's yeah. that's personally become one of my wife and my favorite songs. One of our couple songs, I guess you would say. Yeah, awesome. Kind of one of those moments right there. And you do you get that all through all of it. It, it. The other thing I wanted to bring up here is that, you know, talking about Jack Irons and what he was doing with the drums seemed to really align uh, in that same year you did this project with Three yeah. Fish, yeah. which, you know, when I listen to No Code, what Jack's doing, what you're doing, and the Three Fish, I mean, there seems to be this, I want to say the tribalism sound, you know, whatever you yeah. categorize that, you know, how did that link up for the two of you guys? Because what a perfect marriage. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, what's interesting is like I think we made that we made that Three Fish record before we made uh, No Code, and um, 
and so when we started making that record, it, it, it fell right in with what we were doing with Richard and, and Robbie. Um, and we, you know, the three fish thing was, uh, there, there was, there really was a no rules openness vibe to that, to those sessions. And, um, uh, you know, we were, we were sort of making Richard play the drum kit, uh, you know, like anything but a rock kit. So we would take his cymbals away, we'd take his hi hat away, replace it with like some toms or you know a couple of gym bays. I mean, we, I mean, I wish we had pictures of that of those setups because they were we didn't have the proper stand, so it, stuff was leaning on things. And but um, yeah, you know, I think at that point we were just trying to bust out of it. I think I think uh, the whole rock grunge thing had kind of gotten so huge that we were we were just trying to push into something else so yeah yeah and i'm well, proud of those three fish records yeah that's uh, I, I like the first one the second one i yeah. think is that's the, that's my favorite of the two yeah. but uh yeah. that's some good yeah. stuff finishing it kind of out on the no code i'll also my visual props here are strong today i know yeah awesome. but this is the uh, latest vault release i haven't even seen a, it yet yeah, this came out uh, that well. It's the uh, the October seventeenth, twenty fourteen show where you guys actually played No Code in full right here. Yeah. And these have been such beautiful packages and so yeah. fun to listen to. What you guys have been doing on those? How far in advance are you all planning these? Like, do you do you have an idea of what the next vault's going to be? Uh, yeah, we have. You know, we're we're probably um, a year ahead of. I think there's a couple in the queue right now um and i think they have to be fully okayed by everybody once they're mixed and all of that um but uh yeah john burton and then brett elias and both those guys uh have been taking notes um we're, we're always sort of looking for uh shows that maybe didn't get a proper release or we weren't happy with the mix of um a lot of people want those super early shows, but we don't have multi-tracks of those early shows. And sometimes the only recordings we have are like cassette or DAT. And sometimes the DAT didn't get, get taken out. The second one didn't get put in. And there's, so there's big holes um, in, in some uh, shows that people are, are looking for. But we're working on, on one right now that we've, there's a, I think we found an audience, a pretty good audience tape. So we're going to try to do some things where we meld the audience tape with the half of a dat. That's cool. So. Early stuff, I'm guessing is what you're yeah. talking about. Some yeah. of the early shows. Yeah. You know, for yeah. cassette culture also coming back these days, I mean, I think there's some forgiveness if you were to press one of those also on cassette. I mean, I think people would understand then that the audio is the audio, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Cassettes sound pretty good. Um, um, we have a little cabin where I grew up and, um, that all we have up there is um, this old stereo with a cassette player. And so I, I brought all my cassettes up there and it's like, I, you know, when you've been listening to MP3s for the last 20 years, um, cassette sounds warm. And there's like some texture and some things in, in, in going on there. I mean, you're missing the top, but um, yeah. I think as a, as a guy with uh, pretty solid tinnitus um, that, 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 I don't miss that top end. <laughs> my son, he's 14 now and probably for the past five years and continues this day to carry one of my old Walkmans around with him. And uh, awesome. we'll bust that out every now and then. It's, I think he and listens are... to it more than I did because I, I, you know, I was cassettes in the 80s, but I, you know, when I grew up, by the time I was hitting teenagers, like CDs were already, already there. So I think yeah. he's definitely hitting it more than I am. Yeah, I still have my original Walkman and that thing is bulletproof. I, you know. They, I don't think they ever made them the same after that. Those first few years that they made those Walkmans, they were mm -hmm. metal. They were like built like a tank. They were really expensive. But that, that, I mean, that was a big deal. Riding the like, all of a sudden you're riding the bus down a half an hour ride downtown with a with music in your ears. It was right. like good times, life changing moments right there. Yes. Uh, my my final prop, and I gotta obviously bring it up because it's the 30th anniversary year of this beautiful pinkish purple record Did we decide on what color that actually is that's i don't know it's just there's a pink yeah there's pinks all kinds of pinks <laughs> the thing about this you know it's a classic record it's yeah. probably not my favorite of the of the pearl jam but it's obviously one of the greatest records of all time i say obviously because the world has decided that over time when i listen to this record every now and then though 
it is undeniable the magic that is happening in it. Like you as one of, you know, the artists and the songwriters, you probably hear the moments you, you know, you, you probably hear it different than I do. But when I hear it, there is, there's that something that you get from those very few albums, you know, in all of time, whether you're listening to the first Pixies record or, you know, some classic Who record or whatever, but there's some sort of magic in there. I mean, does that, does that come out to you at all? Well, I mean, especially when I think about um, when I think about the, you know, recording that record and recording the demos leading up to it, um, there, there was a real excitement and, um, you know, it was kind of unbelievable in some ways because we because Stone and I had been gone through the Mother Love Bone thing and just to just to feel like we we're getting another chance. Um, I think that played into it. Um, and I think, you know, I always say like, I always feel like I really, I always gravitated towards like that genuine excitement and that energy, like that, you know, when people are like emanating like joy and like pain and all the things that come out of when you play music. And, you know, again, we, we weren't talking about anything at that time, except for, hey, that that section's a little bit fast or we weren't playing to a click. So there was a lot of like, Hey, it's speeding up a little bit too much on this section. Um, but we were, we, you know, we were so excited to be in the studio and we did it on our own, did it with a local, you know, producer, engineer guy, Rick Parashar. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I don't hear the record necessarily that way anymore because it's gone through so many iterations and we've played those songs so many times. Mm. But when you play those songs live, that, that, that feeling comes right back because I think, the, I think the crowd hears it the way that we were playing it in 1990, 91, you know, right. so. You did the music for Jeremy, right? Was that you? Yeah. You got the writing credit yeah. on that? Yeah like going back and trying to separate myself from what that song has been all these years too, uh, and taking Ed's vocals off of it, especially it's, it's almost surprising even more. I think that that becomes such a big hit because what you're doing musically on that is so interesting and, and almost abstract in a way. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was having a 12 string bass. Um, and I, I'd written, I'd written that riff and the why go riff on an acoustic guitar with the idea that, I mean, I'd, played a 12 string bass before so i knew what it was going to sound like and um and you know props to you know props to stone and mike for you know coming up with you know interesting guitar parts on those songs um when the bass is taking up so much sonic space um but it you know it you know i was really super influenced by cheap trick um tom peterson played a 12 string and so you know that song heaven tonight and uh need your love mm -hmm. uh they're, they're sort of symphonic and almost classical in, in 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 a way um and so that's i think that's what i was that's you know that's what was coming out of me yeah on that one yeah it's, it's cool stuff all through that i know there's a record store day release kind of celebrating uh with, with a live too and uh yeah, I, I've been pulling out some of the weirdo parts of it, like Dirty Frank and, you know, some of that stuff kind of revisiting. I mean, there's such fun stuff that goes all the way through all of that, which, again, you know, it's what you've done. Uh, you all have done through the entire career. I, I so appreciate that. I, I know it's usually secretive, but do you guys have the next steps? I mean, you obviously didn't get together for a pandemic record as a band. I mean, do you know what no. happens next? Well, uh we actually had a little bit of a play um like three weeks four weeks ago in seattle um just got in a room and just we weren't playing any songs we just jammed and it was like so beautiful like i mean i just missed that so much um and we talked a little bit just about how everybody was feeling uh i think you know we have a few things penciled in for next year hopefully Hopefully this variant and whatever's going on with vaccinations and all that stuff, hopefully that stuff, hopefully we turn the corner. Um, it feels like we're sort of still teetering on the edge of this thing. So um, if, uh, if we turn the corner, then hopefully we hit like late winter, early spring with like a tour, you know, or a leg um, at least. Um, I mean, we're, we're jonesing to do it. Um, and we would 
some of the sh- most of the shows that we that we have to make up for the two legs, the European leg and the U.S. leg. Most of those shows are in, um, you know, they're they're indoors. So um, I I just don't know if I want to go out and do thirty shows where you're checking vaccination cards and I you know it's like, I mean, hopefully we can be smart enough that again we can just turn the corner and you know by March we're like rocking and everybody can feel good about you know traveling and and all and go, and getting twenty thousand people into a space. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're already. I I saw Brandy Carlisle like ten days ago here in Missoula, at a killer outdoor venue, and it was it was religious. You know, it was you know it was people were so happy to be there, and Brandy and her band were so happy to be there, and um, so she's got a great new yeah. single. She's got a great yeah. new single. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Always love what she does. She's got a great band. Her new band is amazing too. She's got she's got a really it's 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 veering off it's getting outside of that country thing and i and the further she gets away from it the more i love it so i'm excited where she's headed i'm not surprised because the twins have always wanted to be grunge stars themselves so it's for sure yeah (laughs) now they got this now they got this african percussionist dude who's like taking it to this cool space and shooter jennings is playing piano it's like it's awesome it's really good I oh, can't wait to see that too. And for you all, I, I know, I mean, we haven't been able to hear the Gigaton songs come to life in themselves. So I know that's uh, something that, you know, we're all interested in hearing what happens, what happens there. Yeah, we got to relearn them again. <laughs> we <laughs> learned all those songs. That was like a year and a half ago. So yeah, yeah. we got some, we got some work to do for sure. <laughs> Well, I look forward to it. I love the headspace that you're in musically right now. Again, this uh, this new solo record, I should be outside. Seriously, you, uh, this is so good. It's just so good. Thank, thank you, Kyle. Thanks, yeah. thanks so much. That means a lot. Yeah, Jeff, it's been a pleasure talking to you once again. Take care. I hope we get to see you sooner than later, man. Yeah, say hi to Louisville. My morning jacket, the Louisville skate park. I love that skate park. Absolutely. Take care. All right, man. See you yeah. around. Bye. Thanks, Kyle. Take care, man. Bye. Bye.